so for our next talk, we're happy to have Richard Hines to talk about Lagrangian Tori in four-dimensional domains. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, so I, I want to report on um, uh, well, some pro progress on quantitative estimates for embedded Lagrangian Tori. So we're interested in things like air, what area classes are possible in, um, in four-dimensional domains. All right, so, so it's... Um, so for all this kind of stuff, well, as I'm working in R4, um, just the standard symplectic R4, and sometimes for coordinates, we'll identify that with C2. Um, and then for all these sort of symplectic embedding questions, computing capacities, um, good test cases are always ellipsoids and polydisks. All right, and those are the definitions, all right? So it's standard now. Right? So, the, so the, the parameters give you the areas of cross sections in the various planes. Um, I'm always writing them so the first factor is the smallest. Um, and then more notation, you've got a ball or an ellipsoid with the same, uh, the same parameters, the cylinder. Um, right. Okay, but the, the focus for me is Lagrangian tori and the first example of product tori, um, just at the bottom there. So again, I'm always assuming A is less than B. So the product Lagrangian torus is just the singular part of the boundary of, um, of a polydisc. Okay, so right. All right, so we're interested in embeddings of Lagrangian tori, and for this to make sense, it has to be a global, a global symplectomorphism. That's right. So you can always find embeddings of tubular neighborhoods. Um, all right. So the question is, when does there exist a global symplectomorphism of R four mapping a, a Lagrangian torus into a particular domain? And these are all right. And these are three results here. Um, so they, they all kind of go on similar lines that there's a there's kind of a borderline where rigidity is lost almost completely. All right, so it's, um, all right, so the first one embeddings into polydisks. So what this is saying is if the smallest factor on the polydisk or the capacity of the polydisk is bigger than two, then um, then there's no restriction on embedding the Lagrangian torus. Um, all right, so remember X is bigger than one here. Right, so, it's, uh, so you can embed any any Lagrangian torus inside a polydisc, as long as the capacity of the polydisc is more than twice um, the first factor on the Lagrangian torus. Right. For embeddings into balls, it turns out the cutoff is a three. Right. So once the capacity of the ball is bigger than three, there's no obstructions on right. There's no obstructions on embedding this um, this Lagrangian torus. Uh, but if C is less than three, then what this theorem says is it says the inclusion map is is optimal. Right. And then a similar thing for ellipsoids. So again, the, the cutoff here is a two. Right? So if the capacity of the ellipsoid is at least two, um, we're looking at an L1x, then there, there are no, no obstructions. But if the ellipse, if the smallest factor on the ellipsoid is less than two, then the best you can do for embedding a product Lagrangian via a Hamiltonian floor or a global symplectomorphism is just the inclusion just the inclusion map. Um, well, we know that, uh, we, we don't know that in all cases. So to prove that we need to assume that the, um, the ratio of the factors on the ellipsoid is an integer. All right, so, it's, um, all right. so, that's, um, so that's how it goes. So that, that tells you when, you can, when, when there's a global symplectomorphism taking, taking product Lagrangians into polydisks, balls, or certain ellipsoids. So some of this is known. Um, if X is one, uh, say the Lagrangian is monotone, and this is um, this was proved by Chile back and Monka, um, at least in the ball case. Um, but their results extend to all dimensions, whereas we don't know we don't know in other dimensions. Um, so as right, so, so I suppose that the interest here is uh, we're dealing with non-monotone, non-monotone Lagrangians, um, but it only works in dimension four. And for cylinders, this is known, right? So if, if you take, I suppose that the first one, if, if you put B equals infinity, then, um, then this follows from results of Chekhanov, because if you, can, if you can put a Lagrangian inside a cylinder, then you have a bound on its displacement energy and, um, and Chekhanov, maybe in Schlenk, know, know the displacement energy of product Lagrangians. And it's exactly the smallest factor. Okay, so those are the, so that's, that's the story embedding Lagrangians into, certain domains. So, uh, 
So uh, give uh, all right. So I'll promote. So we'll give, give some some asides about this. Um, so you can think of this, if you like, as computing the shape or versions of the shape invariant for these for these open sets. Um, so shape um, was so well not exactly the same definition, but versions of this go back to Eli Ashberg in the early 90s. So it's, it's, it's some, somehow kind of parameterizing which, which area classes of Lagrangians you can, you can put inside your, inside your open set. Okay, so we're dealing with a Hamiltonian shape. It just, just pairs x, y such that the Lagrangian embeds. Um, and you can think of it, I guess, you can, so you can think of this as some kind of version of a symplectic capacity because it's, um, it's certainly monotonic under embeddings and it has the right, the right scaling properties as well. Uh, right. Okay, so another way of writing our results. So th these are graphs of, we're calling this H, this means it's the Hamiltonian shape because we're looking at um, Hamiltonian flows apply, applied to the Lagrangians. Uh, so the story is that the, um, right, so, so the shape, well, right, so the way we've, the, the way we've defined it, it's, um, it's a subset of the, the first quadrant in R2, X is less than Y, so it's, Right, so it's right. So it's sitting above the diagonal in the first quadrant, and then the results are saying that the shape is kind of the. Um, it's it's similar to the moment map, but you get um, it's similar to the moment image, but you get this strip along the y axis, added in. Right, so that's it. So for the ball, you get the, the moment image of the ball, but plus this um, plus this strip along the y axis, uh, and the reason for that it's saying if you get a very thin Lagrangian, then you can always embed it. So a thin Lagrangian corresponds to a point close to the y-axis, and that's included in the shape. So it's, uh, okay, then same thing for polydisks and ellipsoids. Right, so you got the so you got the moment image plus this plus this strip um, of a particular width, which is determined by the by the calculations. All right, so that's um, so that's another way of thinking of it. So, so this is the this is the shape. Um, uh, well, in this well. So this is a little bit of an aside to the aside here. Um, so th there's other definitions of shape, maybe more in the spirit of the original thing. You could you could ask just which which area classes are possible for embedded Lagrangian tori. Right? Um, so well, so, uh, well, I suppose there's only. I mean, it's still a conjecture that any non-monotone Lagrangian is Hamiltonian isotopic to a product Lagrangian. So it's um, so maybe this is nothing new anyway, but. Um, um, anytime you want to have tea, Margo, I'm not going to continue listen, watching this. Okay. Well, that's enough for me, I guess. <laughs> okay. Um, right. So it's, yeah. Okay. So it's, right. So you have a, right. Um, so you, you could, you could take any Lagrangian torus and ask which, which area classes are possible for Lagrangian tori. Um, so that's, um, Maybe there's a lot of information there. It's a little bit unwieldy, but um, but one way to deal with it is if, if you have a Lagrangian torus in R four, there's essentially a canonical basis for the um, for the homology. Right? So, so you can always find a, a Maslow two basis for the homology, um, which are ordered by area, and um, and if it's if it's non-monotone, this um, there's actually there's a unique basis so that the the area of the first vector is, is less than a half the area of the second vector. Um, the basis isn't unique in the monotone case, but in that case, all the areas are the same anyway. So, okay, so, so there's a well-defined um, general shape here, just so, so you, you take a basis satisfying these properties, work out the area of the two, um, the two basis vectors. So the, the area is just, just the integral of a primitive of the symplectic form, um, around a class. Um, okay, so, so you can work out all possible area classes of embedded Lagrangian tori. Um, and a consequence of our results is that that's basically the same thing. Um, well, sorry, it's good, there's less information here. So this, this is the same as the Hamiltonian shape, but just restricted to the same, to the possible set. So if you take the Hamiltonian shape, you restrict to the diagonal Together with the set where two x is less than y, then you get this. You get this general shape. So in a sense, the general shape is um, is a subset of the Hamiltonian shape. Um, so that's um, 
Right. So it's, I guess, what one inclusion is is clear here, right? So the um, so it's clear that the the Hamiltonian shape is a subset of the general shape, but our methods show that the, the same obstructions you get for the Hamiltonians you get for general for general Lagrangians. So this so it sort of also answers that question. Um, all right. So then, okay. Well, so we at some point we we're quite optimistic about this then. So you kind of, okay, so now, okay, so now we've computed some kind of new sort of capacity. It, it takes values in open sets. Maybe it leads to some embedding obstructions. Um, and there is some, some kind of, um, some motivation for that in the literature. Um, so there is, uh, so, so this is another version of capacity. So this is a, this is a, sorry, this is another version of shape. So it's a shape for, um, for an open subset of the cotangent bundle of a torus. Um, but I'm only considering Lagrangian embeddings, which are no, Lagrangian embeddings of a torus, which are, should be TN there. So Lagrangian embeddings of a torus, which are homotopic to the zero section. So you look at those, those Lagrangian embeddings, and then you work out the area class, which is just going to be the pullback of um, uh, the Louisville form on the cotangent bundle. And I, I look at all, all possible values of that. Um, and we can think of these as being points in Rn. So there's some kind of identifications going on here. So we've got to identify the cotangent bundle of the torus with torus times Rn. And then as far as the homology goes, if you take a constant section, so just Tn times a point, then the, the cohomology class of that one form should just be the should just be the point. Okay, so right, so so you make these identifications, that gives you a version of shape for um, Lagrangian tori in the particular homology class, and there's a famous result of Benchi and Sikharov. Um, all right, so where we take an open connected set in Rn, and then the, the shape of this subset of the cotangent bundle of the torus. Is exactly is exactly the set A. So in other words, for this category of symplectic manifolds, shape they're completely determined by the shape. So, so okay, so that's, that's kind of a classical result. So this was sort of proved around 1990, late 80s even. Um, all right, so what can you do with our stuff? Um, right. So um, well, so first of all. So, so all, all I'm using here is if there's a symplectic embedding, then, then the shape of the domain has to be a subset of the shape of the, the shape of the range. So first of all, we don't actually get um, Gromov's non-squeezing theorem. And so, so the best you can do is if a ball is contained in a cylinder, then the, the capacity of the ball has to be no more than twice the capacity of the cylinder. So it's not looking great. Um, and actually for ellipsoid, if you're looking at ellipsoid embeddings into ellipsoids more generally, you don't, it doesn't tell you anything you don't know anyway. So it's um, so any obstructions you get out of this for ellipsoid embeddings are completely determined by just the Gromov width and the volume. It's actually there's less information than the Gromov width and the volume. However, um, if you look at polydisc embeddings, then there's maybe a little bit new. So aut automatically, if my if my optimal Lagrangian embedding is the inclusion, then it tells you that the um, the inclusion has to be optimal for the polydisc as well. Um, so, well, so, so part of these results are kind of saying there's, there's a lot more flexibility for Lagrangian embeddings. So having a Lagrangian embedding doesn't imply you can embed the whole, the whole polydisc. But, um, but if the Lagrangian embeds by the inclusion, then the polydisc also embeds. So we get, so we get obstructions on polydisc embeddings like these two. So, it's, um, so all right. So, for instance, okay. So, so the, the cutoff for flexibility for polydisc embeddings is when the, the capacity is two. So, the first one then, so if A is less than two, then the um, the polydisc embeds only if it embeds by an inclusion. And then there's a similar thing for polydisc embeddings into ellipsoids with all of the hypotheses. So, firstly, we can only do with ellipsoids where the the ratio of the factors is an integer. And second, for this to be true, you need the the smallest factor on the ellipsoid to be less than or equal to two. Okay, then, then the polydisc embedding is, the inclusion is optimal. So it's not too bad. So this gives you, um, well, the first result is known um, by Hutchings um, combined with the work of Choi. Um, 
both. So anyway, so we, we can reprove that. Um, so this is using ECH methods, or the paper, the paper is beyond ECH. Um, and the second result is known um, similar kind of techniques, but constrained only if X is less than two, I believe. Um, so right, so in Putchin's paper, it's, it has this result for X less than two, but the same hypothesis, the integer, the ellipsoid has to have integer ratios on the, um, on the parameters. But that's been, um, that's been generalized now by Digiosia, Nelson, Ning, Weiler, and Yang. Um, so actually, you, you can you can um, generalize this to where the um, the ratio of the factors on the ellipsoid is a half integer, uh, but still that's condition that x has to be less than two. So it's a little bit strange. So somehow our results, um, our proofs are a little bit easier in the case when x is bigger than two. So, uh, so this sort of complements itself a little bit. Um, Okay, so I'll try and talk about this a little bit then. So I'm going to show more or less how the proof goes in the case when, um, so the Lagrangian case when, the, the case when x is less than, x is bigger than two and you're embedding in an ellipsoid um, with capacity less than two. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, all right, uh, questions here? All right. Okay, um, all right, so this, all right. <clears throat> Right, so this is supposed to be a little sketch showing you why all rigidity, uh, why this whole problem becomes completely flexible once once the capacities get beyond two, um, or whatever the whatever the case is. Um, right, so what's what's drawn here? This is a this is an immersed Lagrangian in um, in C two, um, but it has right. But it, so this is an immersed Lagrangian in T two, in in C two, but it has prescribed area class basically. All right, so gamma is, is winding is winding n times around a square of area just slightly bigger than one. And sigma is just the boundary of the of the unit disk. All right, so E1, E2 here, this is a this is a Maslov two basis. Right, so it's a Maslov two basis for the homology of that immersed Lagrangian. Um, and then if you check the area class, so the uh, well so sigma has area class one that, that bounds the, the disk of area one. Uh, right, so that, that's the formula for the area of omega two, of E2. Um, so you can see, so, so I can get E2 to have area anything bigger than one and be able to take A as close to one as I like just by taking N very large. So, right, so, so more or less I, I can arrange for this immersed Lagrangian to sit in very close to a product of two disks of area one and prescribe the area class. Um, okay, well, I mean, right, we're not talking about immersed Lagrangians, though. We have to talk about embedded Lagrangians because um, otherwise there's an H principle. Um, right, so, so we, need, we need to kill the intersections. So all of the intersections sit above the part of gamma, which is in the, in the bottom right region. Uh, so, the, so the plan is to kill the intersections. We've got to, we've got to move the, we've, we've got to, well, so the method is I want to apply a compactly supported Hamiltonian to that red bit of gamma times sigma. So I just want to kind of move that red bit up in the Z2 direction to kill off um, all of the intersections and produce an embedded Lagrangian. Okay, well, so the Hamiltonian that does this is that one there, right? So chi, so chi is a function of Z1, G is a function of Z2. So you, you choose G, G is, is a Hamiltonian function which displaces the unit, the unit disk. So you can do that inside a, inside a disk of area roughly two. So I need area roughly two in the fiber. And chi is some uh, cutoff function. So it depends on Z1, it's a cutoff function. It wants to be near, it wants to be equal to one near the bottom right corner. So when you're near the bottom right corner, the flow exactly displaces the fibers. Um, but then you've got to worry that you don't create any new intersections. Um, so, Okay, right, so, so with everything oriented correctly here, um, th these, these red arrows are supposed to be telling you where the, wh where, the, where the flow would go when you project it down onto the Z1 plane. But uh, the trick is that we can arrange so that the derivative of chi is bounded by, bounded by one. Uh, the norm of G is bounded by one. So, so the norm of these, these red arrows are again bounded by one. And that means this flow never, when you look at a bit of the flow inside the square, it never quite 
goes far enough to produce new intersections. And the vertical bit goes off to the right, so that doesn't produce anything new either. Um, so, okay, so that, that gives you an embedded Lagrangian, but um, the penalty is we've now, we've now used area two in the base and area two in the fiber. Um, so the conclusion is you have an embedded Lagrangian in a, in a polydisc P22. Um, and if you're clever about this and you kind of study it up a little bit, it's actually, um, it's actually in an ellipsoid 24 in, in the, in the, the toric uh, moment picture, you can draw an ellipsoid 24 intersect it with the square P22, and you can actually force it to sit inside that, which is enough to answer all of our, all of our results. Um, so that, 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 that explains why all the rigidity is left where this, when this factor on the ellipsoid is bigger than two. Um, right, so, so that, that explains that the ellipsoid examples because um, I'm assuming the factor is, is an integer. Uh, for the ball, you can check that E24 intersect P22 sits inside a ball of size three. So it's really that the same construction explains everything. All right, so that's, okay, so that's why rigidity is, is lost at some point. So now I want to talk about the other side of this. All right, any other questions there? Okay, all right, so anyway. All right, so the other side, all right, so I want to prove this. Um, so I want to show that the inclusion is optimal, um, assuming that X is bigger than two, A is less than two, and K is the, the, uh, the ratio of the factors on the ellipsoid, that's, that's supposed to be an integer. All right, so the, um, so the ingredients for this, uh, first of all, it's, um, uh, right, so we need some results about holomorphic curves in ellipsoid cobordisms. Right, so it's, um, all right, so how this goes then, so you, so epsilon is supposed to be very small, capital S is supposed to be very large, but, um, but we can look, look at an ellipsoid embedding from this E epsilon epsilon S into, um, um, into the target space. Okay, we're gonna study holomorphic curves with as asymptotic to rebe orbits. Um, you know, we, right, so we, we assume these ellipsoids are irrational. And then, um, so alpha one, alpha two are the, the simple rebe orbits on A, E, A, K, A. And beta one, beta two are the simple rebe orbits on the, so this E epsilon epsilon S is supposed to be a very small skinny ellipsoid. All right, and then the, the plan is, first of all, we have to study this some moduli space here. So, um, well, I, instead of writing this down, I'm gonna drop just like what a little sketch of what it is. Um, so, so we're gonna study this moduli space and then do a neck stretching argument. So it's a neck stretching arg argument along the boundary of a tubular neighborhood of the Lagrangian. Okay, so what, um, so the moduli space, <laughs> okay, <laughs> this. So this, right, so this, this is supposed to represent an ellipsoid cobordism here. And then, right, so we're looking at holomorphic curves. Um, you, you've got to put um, a compatible, almost complex structure on this with, with cylindrical ends. So it's you know, kind of a standard story now. And then, right, then I want to study holomorphic curves with multiple positive ends and a single negative end. So as far as the positive ends go, I mean, it's not a great picture, but M of those positive ends are asymptotic to the same short orbit on the ellipsoid EAB. And then a single positive end is asymptotic to the long orbit. Um, and the negative end is a t-fold cover of the short orbit on this E epsilon epsilon s. And t, the formula for t is chosen exactly so this is a, these curves have Fredholm index zero. So, all right, so that's the moduli space we want to look at. And then, right, so this is supposed to represent neck stretching here. So you take that skinny ellipsoid and you put it almost right on the embedded Lagrangian, right? So, so, I, so somehow or other, I, or what I'm interested in, I have some embedded Lagrangian torus inside, inside my ellipsoid EAB. I put this little skinny ellipsoid on the Lagrangian and then by the, the Weinstein neighborhood, you take a Weinstein neighborhood of the Lagrangian, the cotangent bundle of the Lagrangian, and I take an, an epsilon disc bundle in there. So it's the epsilon disc bundle defined with respect to a flat metric on the Lagrangian. Um, so it's a flat metric on the Lagrangian. That means that the Reeb orbits on the boundary of this disc bundle correspond to geodesics on the Lagrangian with respect to the flat metric. 
So I pretty much understand what they are. Right? So they're, they're indexed just by homology class on the, on the torus. Okay, so this is what happens when you stretch the neck. So you get a, well, you get that kind of thing. So you, you get a curve inside the disc bundle with one negative end on the, on the ellipsoid. That's the negative end we started with. And it turns out there's exactly T plus one positive ends. And each of those T plus one positive ends match up with some kind of holomorphic curve in the complement of the disc bundle, or you can think of it as just kind of in the complement of the Lagrangian. Um, so these holomorphic curves at the top level have a negative end, which you can think of as being asymptotic to a, to a geodesic on the Lagrangian. So that's the, um, so, okay, so that's what happens. Um, all right, okay, so there's, there's T plus one curves in the top level, right, so I said that. Okay, and then the claim is you can just read off the, um, you can read off the constraints from this. Um, okay, so there's there's two cases. Um, so, all right, so, so, so to get this conclusion, we do need M to be very large. So M is the, is the number of, um, the number of positive ends of curves in our moduli space, which are asymptotic to the short orbit on the big ellipsoid. So we need, we need this, we need existence of this moduli space when M is very large. Anyway, okay. So in the first case, suppose, uh, right. So suppose all the G of Essex are asymptotic to orbits in the class, um, right, or, or, or G of Essex in the class I comma zero. So this homology class is defined with respect to our, our canonical basis of the, of the torus. So, the, so in other words, they're, they're winding around the geodesic, which bounds, which bounds a disk of area one. Um, well, okay, so it turns out in this case, it, there's T plus one curves in the top level. It turns out T of them have to actually be planes and have no positive ends. So a little argument for that, but then you can just count the area. So the, the area of our initial curves in the moduli space. So you have M ends asymptotic to the short orbit that has action M times A, and then a single end asymptotic to the long orbit. That's, so that's M A plus K A. That has to be bigger than the number of planes. And by index reasons, the number of planes is, is T N plus K plus one. So you rearrange that inequality and that gives a contradiction if M, well, so it gives a contradiction if A is bigger than two so if A is less than two and M is very large, right? So I'm only claiming rigidity if A is less than two. So if A is less than two, um, the left-hand side here is positive and it's gonna get very large as M goes to infinity. So the idea is that gives a, that gives a contradiction. Um, all right, so that's, the, that's one. So that's the case where we need M to be very large. Um, the alternative then is that we get, um, you get more interesting curves at the, um, at the top level. Um, so in particular, the, there's gonna be some kind of, um, some sort of holomorphic curve at the, the top level in that picture, which is asymptotic to a G as in a class IJ with G negative. Okay, so we just have to analyze that curve. Um, I don't know how many positive ends it's gonna have, but it's gonna be some number less than M. Um, and then it, it may have either zero or one ends on alpha two. Okay, so then you just kind of trace this through. So you write down the, um, I can compute the area because I, I, know, I know the area class of the, of the negative end. Um, I, know, I know the action of the, of the positive asymptotic limits. Um, the index has to be one. Um, and so it's, that's a calculation. It's um, you know, somehow generically, it has to be one. Otherwise we see curves of negative index somewhere else. All right, and then what you do, you, you substitute the, um, you substitute the index formula into the area formula and you get that. Um, all right, and area has to be positive. So that's, that's the formula. All right, so the, and the left-hand side, so now I'm assuming J is negative. Assuming J is negative, I'm assuming X is bigger than two. Uh, so the left-hand side is bounded above by wh what I would get if I take J to be negative one. And so, so I wanna take J to be as, well, as positive as possible, and the best we can do is negative one. So if you take J equals negative one, the last two terms give you um, two minus X when you add the last two terms together, which is negative. So the last two terms give a negative contribution. If A is less than two, the first term gives a negative contribution. So I have to get something positive from that second term, uh, right? And the only way that can happen is if kappa equals one. 
Um, so, okay, so you can just substitute in J equals minus one, kappa equals one, and then the inequality exactly um, boils down to this thing I've got written at the bottom, which is like saying inclusion is, inclusion is optimal. So that's it. So, so at least in the case when X is bigger than two, these estimates just, um, just drop out. Um, okay, so that's, that's that then. Um, all right, well, so, right, so, so the gap is we have to prove that that moduli space is, um, is non-empty for, in particular for large M. Um, and that's, that's non-trivial, right? So for that, um, right, so we have to use a lot of stuff. Um, so this, so this, it's an induction. So this is the step one that was missing construction of these moduli spaces. So we have to rely on, um, we're sort of following an induction arguments of Macduff. Um, we need to kind of keep correcting things. We'll sort of see where this comes. We have to know about the existence of certain cylinders. So I wrote something about that with, uh, with Kerman. And then ultimately it relies on obstruction bundle gluing, which is due to um, Hutchings and Taubes. Right? So, so I'm not gonna to try to describe that. So we'll just, um, we'll just draw a little picture again instead. All right, so this, um, all right. So this is supposed to explain the induction argument here. Right, so what's going on? So I'm, I'm trying to, okay, so, so the, the induction hypothesis, so suppose I've constructed these curves for M, so with M positive ends on alpha one, and I'm gonna try and construct the same moduli space, but with M plus one curves on alpha one. So let's kind of begin. So the, um, so the top left curve is something that exists by assumption. Um, there's an advantage here, all these moduli spaces are compact as well. So that's, um, that's kind of nice. So once you construct them for one almost complex structure, you have flexibility there. Um, okay, so that's, so the curve on the top right, on the top left exists. Top right is not so hard. So we come out of uh, my work with Kerman or out of ECH or probably some version of contact homology as well. So the top right is just the cylinder between the, the short orbits on EAB. Right, but now we have to worry a little bit about the, about where the negative ends are. So there's a little bit of, so the middle level here is the simplectization of the boundary of an ellipsoid. It has to be, the parameters on the ellipsoid have to be a little bit bigger than T. So it's an E1 T plus epsilon. So there's an argument, the curve at the top left, I can get a curve asymptotic to the a T fold cover of the short orbit on a, on a scaling of an E1 S. But the same thing goes through as long as the, the second parameter is bigger than T. So we'll take it as small as we can get it and just take a T, um, right, to, to take the, the second parameter on the, the middle ellipsoid to be T one plus epsilon. Okay, at the minute, in the middle level, there's a pair of pants. All right, uh, the, the bottom, uh, right, the, the negative end of the pair of pants is on a gamma one to the T plus one now. And then at the, at the lower level, you correct that gamma one to the T plus one. It turns out it has the same index or the same Conley's Ender index, now is a beta one to the T plus two in this very skinny ellipsoid. So, okay, so that's, so the plan is to glue all this together. Um, so it's index wise, it looks fine. So because of this T plus epsilon, things are perfectly arranged for this middle pair of pants to have Fredholm index zero. Um, and in fact, it's easy to see that this curve exists, but the reason why you can see it exists is because it's exactly, it's a, it's a T plus one times multiple cover of just a trivial cylinder in that simplectization. So this middle curve is certainly not cut out transversely. And that's why we need the, um, that's why you need the obstruction bundle gluing to do this. <coughs> Pardon me. Anyway, um, well, anyway, so that's, well, this has been done by Hutchings and Taubes, and if, right, and if, if we're okay to apply that, then this gives us our induction step to produce these curves of very large, very large M, um, which is the end of the proof, right? So that's that. Um, uh, right, so that, that, that's the proof, right? So that, that's, that's, the, so that, that's enough to prove um, in these examples, kind of the, the, the area class version of the shape. If you want the Hamiltonian version of the shape, you also have to understand what's happening when, when X is less than two. And there we got a bit stuck. So it turns out this, right? So, so in, in all this algebra, I, I needed the assumption that X was less than two. 
basically because the, the third term in that equation, if X is, sorry, I need to the assumption that X is bigger than two. If X is less than two, the third term in that equation would come out to be positive. And then well, we couldn't get a contradiction the same way as before. So for X less than two, we need a different moduli space. So it's, well, so, okay. so the, the notation's the same, but now I want all the positive ends to be on alpha two. Um, and somehow, right, so using this kind of induction method, um, using whatever we, we know about ECH or, um, we, right, I, I don't know how to construct this using elementary methods, but um, it is non-empty um, due to work of Kyla Siegel, um, which I think is maybe in preparation, but anyway. It's, um, so we, we can use Siegel's work, as, as, right, so he has, has a big a big machinery about finding holomorphic curves in ellipsoid cobordisms. And this is one example where, um, where it applies to show that this moduli space is non-empty. Well, actually, well, maybe you don't. So actually it shows it's non-empty when M is two, but that's, that was kind of the case we're struggling with. So the, the case where we couldn't get is, is to show that this moduli space is non-empty with two, two positive ends asymptotic to alpha two. So that's, that's where we got stuck to produce that curve, but it does come out of, um, it does come out of Siegel's machinery. Um, so, all right, so that's it. So that would be the, so that's right. So, so and then once you know these moduli spaces exist, then th these, these imply the sharp results on um, for Lagrangian embeddings. All right, so that's, um, so I think that's the end of that. Any questions there? All right, um, okay, so we move on. So now, <clears throat> well, all right, so another thing, all right, there seems to be kind of a trickier question then. So there's also, um, well, this is okay. So the motivation for us, I guess, is you know when you talk about ball embeddings, you, know, you, you get one ball embedded by just by Gromov. You get obstructions on that, and then the next question is to start asking about ball packings. Um, but of course, this is a delicate business because it starts tying in with things like um, you know displacement energy of Lagrangians and um, and so sort of delicate issues. Anyway, okay. So this is um. Right so, right, so the general question is then, so a Lagrangian is not occupying any, any volume. So if you can embed one Lagrangian with a certain area class, there's, there's no immediate obstructions to embedding, say, infinitely many in the same domain with the same area class. So we want to try and understand that. Um, okay, well, I don't think we understand it completely, but there's, there's a, few, a few examples where you can get... Um, well, so, so you, can, you can kind of see where the, see where the borderline is going to come in again. All right, so two results here then. Um, okay, so that's right. So if we take a polydisc, or actually a cube. So if, if, we, if we take a cube of capacity less than or equal to two, uh, as long as C is bigger than one, this, this standard monotone product torus sits inside there by inclusion. Um, and we claim is, and the, the claim is that there's, you can't get another Lagrangian torus in there with the same area class. In fact, you can't even get another Lagrangian torus in there with, um, with integral area class. Um, so it's, well, actually it follows from the previous results that um, the, the, on, the only Lagrangian tori, the only integral Lagrangian tori contained in there have to be monotone. Um, and then the theorem is that any, any so any, any monotone Lagrangian torus in this cube has to intersect just the standard product if C is less than two. But then, right, but then if you let C get bigger than two, then we lose a bunch of rigidity. All right, so if, um, so if C is bigger than two, all right, so then what? So then, the, right, so then, then there's, well, so I'm working with integral Lagrangian tori because it's kind of a nice, nice picture. So then you can, you, you can look at all integral Lagrangian tori, which naturally sit inside, um, which naturally sit inside the cube. So if, if C is just slightly bigger than two, then there'll, there'll be four of them, right? So L11, L12, L21, L22. But the thing is, right, but the, this theorem is saying that th these things are, are not sort of a full packing in any sense. So there are integral Lagrangian tori in the complement of those four. Um, for example, in fact, you can even find a symplectomorphism from the closed polydisc into the complement of those Lagrangians. 
Um, so, right, so I need the closed polydisc. So, then the, the open polydisc just embeds by the inclusion, but the closed polydisc contains um, contains a copy of L11 in its boundary. So, in, in that bottom theorem, are, are K and L integers? Oh, yeah, sorry. Right, yeah, right, they're integers. Right. Um, yeah, otherwise, <laughs> right. yeah, otherwise, there's not much left, I guess, after all. Right. Yeah. Um, Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so another way of saying it is that um, if you take L11, then okay, we, we know it's displaceable in PCC when C is bigger than two. But the claim is now you can displace it not just from itself, but from the other product integral Torah. So somehow, right. So even for these packing, then we we kind of see this um, right, where we see, see this boundary between rigidity and flexibility. All right. So I want to talk a little bit about. Um, oops, going wrong there, you know? Right. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about the rigidity side of this, right? So, it's, so since we're talking about holomorphic curves, then so roughly how does that go? So there's a lot of work on um, on Lagrangian tori in S two times S two, um, right? So for the rigidity result, that the strongest um, the strongest case, we might as well just take C equals two. So C equals two. You've got the the poly disk. Um, of area two two, and then you can compactify that to S two times S two, um, and then the theorem saying that if you take a monotone Lagrangian in S two times S two, well L C is the Clifford torus or just L one one, right? So we're going to argue that by contradiction. So any monotone Lagrangian has to intersect intersect the Clifford torus. All right, so you can kind of argue a bit like this then. So it's um. So S0, S infinity, T0, T infinity is supposed to be these kind of axes in, um, in S2 times S2. So coming from, so if you think of the moment image, just the boundary of the square. Um, all right, and then it's sort of, well, it's a stretching argument again, but so up to Hamiltonian diffeomorphism, I, I can assume that my, um, my monotone Lagrangian is, is disjoint from those axes. So it's, it's possible to, and, and leave and leave the Clifford torus alone at the same time. So it's possible to, to move the move the Lagrangian off the axes. Um, but if you if you look at the complement of those axes in um, in S two times S two, what you're left with is just a product of two cylinders, and that's naturally included in the cotangent bundle of T two. Okay, so really, what we have now we have two Lagrangians in the cotangent bundle of T two. Now, okay, so now there's a there was a, a result of um, Dimitroglou, Rizzle, Goodman, and Ivry. Um, any exact Lagrangian in there in the cotangent bundle of T2 is Hamiltonian isotopic to the zero section. Um, well, actually, in my identification, I could even assume here that the, the Clifford torus is the zero section. So it's not, it's not claim, well, okay, you know, it's, um, th th there's no claim on this sticking inside some kind of disk bundle, but anyway. But at any exact Lagrangian in T star T2 is Hamiltonian isotopic to the zero section. In particular, it has to intersect the zero section. Um, so um, the question is also, are we done? Um, so unfortunately not. Um, so the, the problem here is when you push the thing off the axes, um, okay, you, you, you're gonna get a Hamiltonian, you, you're gonna get a Lagrangian torus in the cotangent bundle of T2 but it might not be homologically non-trivial, right? So it might be a you might end up with a homologically trivial torus. In which case, even though it's monotone, I can't conclude that it's exact, so I can't um, I can't do this result. Uh, so okay, so that's right. So this is where we have to start doing some stuff. Um, okay, so right. So the plan is that's not going to work. So so the game is instead to remove a different set of curves, such that when when I push the Lagrangian off, it is homologically non-trivial. Um, so the game is instead of taking, right, so, so be, before we, we kind of found a Lagrangian in the complement of the, let's remember what these were, there was the, 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 the T0 and the, the T infinity, we're thinking in the class, right, so it's like a label homology classes just by how many copies of um, S2. So we, we have the T0 and T infinity, I'm gonna say in the class zero one, one, and we also have the S0 and S infinity. So, so the S0 and S infinity, I'm saying are in class one comma zero, and I want to replace them by holomorphic spheres in a class one comma t. Okay, so there's a little bit of, okay, there's a little bit of just kind of blowing up, blowing down here. Um, 
Right, so just a little example. If, if you did happen to have two holomorphic spheres in the class one comma D, uh, they would intersect in two D points generically. Um, and then F are supposed to be the spheres in the, in the fiber, so in the opposite class, in the class zero, one through these points. Uh, then you could play a little game. You could blow up those points, um, right? And then, right, so then pull back the G, the H, and the Fs. So, so they're, they're the transforms. And then we can inflate. Uh, sorry, a little mistake here. I think I want to inflate, I want to inflate G and H um, with capacity D and then blow down, blow, blow down the transforms of the Fs. So the game here, so G and H have area two plus two D, right? Because it's because the the um, the areas of the S2s are two. So G and H have area two plus two D. Uh, the Fs have area um, two, right? Well, anyway, <laughs> but, uh, right. So, so what, what I want to do then, so it's, um, all right, but, but T's, well, okay. So the Fs have area two. So when, when I do all this, this inflation of, so after, after I blow up the points, the G and the H are going to have self-intersection number zero. So when we do the inflation, their area doesn't change. So G and H are going to stay at area 2D plus two. But um, if you look at what's happening to the fibers, so suppose if we look at a smooth fiber like T zero, it starts off having area two, but it intersects G once and H once. So when you inflate those two spheres, it's going to bump up to two plus two D again. Um, so, okay, so anyway, so, okay. So just a little bit playing around with inflation, blowing up, blowing down. This gives you a new copy of S2 times S2. It still comes out to be monotone, but now uh, the transforms of the G and the H now become um, symplectic spheres in the one zero class. So it's kind of, sorry, so this kind of change of coordinates, we've kind of converted the 1D class to the 1, 0 class. All right, okay. So, right. So I wanna kind of choose G and H so that they're in the complement of the Lagrangians, but so that our Lagrangians are homologically non-trivial in the complement, in the complement of the G and the H. All right, so this is what I wanna do. All right, so it's, so it's a whole game now is to choose very convenient G and H so that um, so when you do all this inflation, first of all, the uh, this mystery Lagrangian plus the Clifford torus stay monotone, plus I want them to become homologically non-trivial in the complement of the G and the H. Um, so um, I'll see why. So it's it's kind of nice word to kind of call G and H here as linking spheres. So I want to kind of somehow kind of find spheres that link link the Lagrangians, and I claim that's easier to do in high degree. Um, all right, okay, so now right, so I'm going to try and draw what's going on here. All right, so this picture is basically, uh, um, right, it's only lifted from, um, well, it's not as professional, but anyway, uh, the, 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 the idea is kind of lifted from the paper of um, Timmy Trogley, Rizzo, Good, Goodman, and Ivory. So the, at the top here, so that's supposed to be a picture of S2 times S2. Um, those, right, so those, those kind of shapes. So it's supposed to be foliated by holomorphic spheres in the class zero one. So I'm thinking the class zero one has been the fiber class here. And then there's a projection onto another copy of S2, which if you like, is just the moduli space of holomorphic spheres in the zero one class. Um, if you like, I mean, you could even identify that with S zero itself. If we, if, we, if we keep the complex, if we keep S zero holomorphic, the projection is just taking the intersection of the sphere with, uh, with S zero. Okay, so that's supposed to be a picture of S2 times S2, um, thinking of it in terms of a foliation by holomorphic uh, spheres. Okay, so what, um, so what they show is if you, so this basically goes back to Gromov, but if you take, now if you study a, um, a complex structure which is degenerate among, along the Lagrangians, we can assume that the projection of the Lagrangians is actually a circle. So for both Lagrangians, that the Lagrangians are going to project to a circle on the base. Uh, so, um, right, well, right, so the, the Lagrangians project to a circle on the base. If you take a point in one of those circles and look at the pre-image, that's going to be a, that's going to be a zero one sphere. And, and the Lagrangian is supposed to intersect that sphere exactly in a circle. Um, okay, so that's the picture. So the point is here, so th these, the fact that these circles are disjoint and embedded, 
that follows from the monotonicity assumption. Right? So, it's, so it's all to do with holomorphic curves can kind of predict twice in this scenario. Okay, so that's what's going on. So the so the, the Lagrangians then we kind of like we see them now as sort of circle bundles over a circle. Um, the Clifford torus is fine. So when you do the Clifford torus, the tor the circles that you see separate S zero and S infinity inside these um, inside these fibers. But the problem is um, for my monotone Lagrangian, it might not be homologically non-trivial, which means um, the circles might bound a disk, which is um, well which is contractible in the cotangent bundle of T2 or in the complement of S0 or S infinity. Um, okay, so right, so what we're trying to do then, so we really want to find, um, we want to find holomorphic spheres, which in particular intersect the disks in this class, in this class tau. So somehow I know for sure I can find a holomorphic sphere that intersects. So there's kind of two families of disks with boundary on, on this monotone L. Things like S0, S infinity intersect one of the families of disks, but the problem is to find holomorphic spheres that intersect the other family. Um, so the game is there. If I could do that, then when I do the blowing up, I can keep L monotone, and also I can make sure that it's homologically non-trivial so that I can apply this, um, this Hamiltonian classification result. All right, okay, so that's that. So now, all right, so now, <clears throat> okay, so how, how to find, um, if you believe that picture, right, so now, right, so now the question is how to find holomorphic curves in a class 1D with kind of good intersection properties with respect to disks with boundary on the, um, on, well, in particular on this monitor on the Lagrangian. Okay, so to do this, we want to sort of see what curves in the class 1D look like as we split them or as we break them along the Lagrangian. So for instance, you could, you know, look at curves in this class through a, a fixed set of points on the Lagrangian, then do the stretch the neck and then see what kind of thing you get. So there's essentially two, two kinds of pictures are possible, assuming the curve breaks. Um, so the type one picture was saying, there's exactly one holomorphic curve. Um, so this is, well, this is sort of one holomorphic curve in the building, which is a limit of the 1D curves. There's exactly one holomorphic curve which projects injectively and is asymptotic to L. Right. So if you, if you look at the projection of that curve under our, um, under our projection map, you kind of get an open set with various punctures corresponding to its, um, corresponding to its asymptotic limits on L. Right. So, that's, so that's type one. Type two, there's exactly two curves in the limiting building which are asymptotic to L and project injectively. So now when you look at the projection by, by P, one of them is going to project on one side of PL, and one will project on one will project on the other side. Um, so, well, so the the reason for that then is just because um, curves in the class one D intersect fibers in the class zero one exactly once, um, and you have positivity of intersection. Um, so, okay, so so you can get these kind of arrangements in the building. So the so the problem is the type one curves are the are the bad case. Sure, okay. Right, so so the, the type one curves are the bad case. So the thing is, I can kind of try and do some deformation and push this curve of type one around. So, so, right, so when we're looking at this type one case, the two disks on the bottom could be covering curves in the fiber. So those two disks on the bottom could be, could, could be planes in, in the class tau. So if you jiggle around, if, if you deform the curve in the type one, maybe you can get a smooth sphere, but it's going to intersect disks in the uh, right, so it's going to intersect broken disks asymptotic to L, but maybe in the wrong half. Whereas in the type two case, we can kind of push the curve either up or down, and I can get the intersections that I want. Um, so, okay, so I don't know how clear that is, but anyway, so, so the game is I, I want, right, I, I want um, holomorphic curves of type 1D that limit onto holomorphic buildings of type two. Then I can kind of try and push them around, get the intersection properties I want, do this blow up, blow down, and then um, hopefully we're done. All right, so, okay, so this is just right, so just the last seconds here then. So, how to find curves of type two? I want them type two with respect to L and LC. All right, so the game is so type, right, so the, the in, right, so curve of class 1D goes through, um, gen, uh, you can find a curve through 2D plus one points, uh, right, so generically. 
So I want to fix d plus one point on the Clifford torus and d plus d point on the other one. Stretch the neck. All right, so then there's sort of three, two, three observations here. The first one is that the curve is type two with respect to the Clifford torus. So that's, um, all right, so that, that goes back to my um, a little argument with uh, a paper with Sam Lissy. So if, if it's a type one situation, you get a curve looking something like this, but all, all the planes that bubble off asymptotic to L, they all lie in the same class. So, right, so if it's right, so, it's, so if you were type one with respect to the Clifford torus, because there's D plus one points fixed on it, you'd see D plus one planes either kind of hanging down from the Clifford torus and intersecting S zero or asymptotic to the Clifford torus and intersecting S infinity. Either way, that contradicts positivity of intersection because you only allow D intersections with uh, the zero section and D intersections with, with infinity. All right, so you type one, so this is right. So we, no restriction on D to prove that. So you're typically gonna be type two with respect to LC. But then you worry about type one, as we have any worry about L, and then try and argue that by contradiction. Okay, so if you're type one with respect to L, same argument, I'm gonna see, so now there's D points fixed on L, I'm gonna see D planes either covering disks in tau or covering the other half. Um, I'll go back a little bit here. So if, if you had disks covering the, the, right, so asymptotic to L, covering the other half of the fibers, they'd intersect both S0 and S infinity. So each of those disks would produce an intersection with both S0 and S infinity. Um, and that's gonna result in a holomorphic plane with uh, a holomorphic building with 2D zeros and poles in addition to the D we've already got by curves asymptotic to um, asymptotic to LC. But I only have D zeros and D poles to play with. So that's, um, that's a contradiction. So if the building is type one with respect to L, there's gonna be D planes as part of the building and they all have to cover disks in tau. All right, okay, but then the punchline is the remaining curves, the holomorphic curves we started with are in class um, 1D, they have area 2D plus two, all right? I've seen D disks bubble off asymptotic to the Clifford torus. So if we subtract those, there's D disks, I'm oh, sorry, even D plus one, sorry. D, right, D, D disks asymptotic to the Clifford torus, you subtract those. There's gonna be D disks covering planes in tau, that's another D off. So the remained, all right, so the remaining part of the building has area two, but there's still D, because the curves in tau have neither zero nor poles, there's still D zeros and poles to find. And we can, we can arrive at a conclusion by applying um, monotonicity. Right, so the old argument going way back to Gromov, if you want to intersect a line at infinity, if we fix a little tubular neighborhood of infinity right from the start, every curve that goes through infinity has to lose a little bit of area. So if D is very large and you have a whole huge number of poles, you have to have quite a lot of area. So that's it. So that's, so the, so that's supposed to be a contradiction. So you can't be type one with respect to L, you have to be type two with respect to L also. Um, and these are the curves I want to kind of get the uh, to get the intersection properties. So anyway, so <laughs> the kind of involved kind of thing there. Anyway, all right. So that's it. Um, thank you very much. I'll stop there. Well, thank you. Uh, questions? Well, I, I have a question. So you you proved that in a cube of size less than two. That any integral Lagrangian intersects L11. Yes. Um, do your methods also prove that any two integral Lagrangians have to intersect each other? Well, no, I don't. It's just this last bit of the argument. I don't know. So somehow, well, no, I don't know that. Um, it's, it's because the proof is using the fact that this is the kind of this is the Clifford torus. Uh -huh. So it's right. So it kind of, yeah, it seems kind of close, but I can't quite prove that yet. So at the minute I'm kind of saying, because one of them is a Clifford torus, I kind of know exactly what, what kind of disks are asymptotic to that. So, so the proof for it is currently it's using, um, it is using the fact that one of them is the Clifford torus and one of them is kind of already homologically non-trivial. Um, but yeah, I mean, it seems likely that the same kind of thing would imply that, but. Um, 
but we haven't proved it. Okay. The related question I have is, is uh, you showed that if the cube is size slightly bigger than two, then you've mm -hmm. got five disjoint integral Lagrangians. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's any upper bounds on how many disjoint integral Lagrangians you could have in there? Yeah, I keep, I keep asking people about this. I have no idea. The thing is, we can only construct five. Um, I mean, it's very possible it's infinity. If I was going to kind of guess, I'd say probably there's infinity, but um, but again, at the moment, we can only actually prove five. Oh. Maybe it's just trying to visualize things, you know, and so somehow the four you can kind of see, the fifth one you kind of have to push off those four, but then you try and get a sixth, and then somehow there's four of them you can see, and there's one that's pretty complicated already, and then you have to get a sixth one kind of. So I think we need something, system. our construction is a little bit ad hoc. I think if we can get something a bit more systematic, I kind of think probably the answer is going to be infinity, but um, I don't really have any evidence for that. Though. Um, okay, thanks. Um, Other questions? And there's, there's no obstructions as far as I know. I mean, it's, um, yeah, I mean, you can try, you know, what holomorphic curve invariance could possibly exist, but I know no way of obstructing more than five. Oh, sorry, you're obstructing less than, you know, and I know no way of getting any kind of upper bound on this. You know, whatever kind of holomorphic methods you, you use, they seem to give zero obstructions once that polydisc has size bigger than two. So, okay. Can so I ask a question that, oh, oh, sorry. No, no, no you were. Oh, no, no, I was saying it'd be hard to prove that that was finite. You're kind of the packing number. Um, Can I ask a question that's only somewhat related to this and mm -hmm. certainly not exactly related to the previous question, but ha have you thought about the stabilized um, polydisc into ellipsoid function? Um, I mean, I guess you, you have some results for polydisc into ellipsoid in, in 4D and then, um, it's, yeah, it's, yes, that, I then I guess part one would be whether those results stabilize, but um, also maybe stronger results hold or don't hold or, or something. I mean, um, uh, well, yeah, I think these, okay. Um, I can also, yeah. I'm sorry. I no, could, no, no. Sorry, I missed the last part. What did you say? Never mind. You, 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 you. Oh no, no. So, so, I, so I was going to say um, a lot of stuff about this is known. So I think so. The the stabilized polydisc into ball is known. Right. That one's known. Yeah, yeah. Um, so then you could look at right. So I think these methods probably extend to stabilized polydisc into ellipsoid. Uh, it's kind of, it's really, it's, it's the kind of thing that exactly should work, right? So it's curves with a single negative end are exactly the kind of curves that stabilize. So I think it's right. I think it's true that these, these should also be optimal obstructions for stabilized polydisc into ellipsoid. Mm -hmm. in, in, with these kind of hypotheses. So as long as the ellipsoid has, um, you know, integer ratio, or that kind of thing. And, right. and C, there's this C parameter, you know, that, the scaling has to be less than two or, or something. Right, exactly. But, right. Uh, right, so, so you see what the function cool. actually is, you wouldn't, you probably don't expect that the stabilized function is actually always less than two, I think. Um, no, no, I think you do, right? I mean, well, we, we, know, we know the graph, we, we know the graph for stabilized polydisc into ball, right? Into ball, right. And it just, it's linear up to, two or something, then just horizontal. Right, but I think if you have a an E1B, it's sort of no longer. Oh, right, there's more parameters here, of course, to worry about. Oh. I can double check my. my oh, thing. you mean you're talking about. Oh, you mean the target is an E1B? Let's say the target is an E12 instead of an E11. Could you, could you work out the whole function like you can in the in the E11. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, right. Yeah, I believe, so. well, okay, I haven't checked it, but I, I don't think there's any, I think it should be exactly the same answer as for, um, as for Lagrangians. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. 
So it's, of course, it's not the same in dimension four, but in the stabilized, um, in the stabilized case, I believe it should be the same. Um, so the obstruction should still hold true because basically you're looking at the, exactly the kind of curves that work in this stabilized case, you know, these things with one negative end. So the obstruction should still be true. And this construction exactly, okay, so it doesn't give you a polydisc, polydisc embedding in dimension four, but it gives you a stabilized polydisc embedding. Um, but I didn't have the impression that they exactly met, that they give you the entire function. I, I, I had the impression that there's some missing information but I, I could be wrong. I have to check. I don't know. Um, maybe, maybe I haven't really thought about it. I just kind of assumed that would be true. <laughs> right, right. I did too. Well, maybe I'll write you an email or something. Okay. I'm curious if you thought about it before. Of course, the um, right the stabilized ellipsoid problem is still open. There's that one. Ellipsoid into ellipsoid. Ellipsoid into well, ellipsoid into ball, of course, still open. Right, right, um, right. Yeah, but it's ellipsoid kind of, into ellipsoid, I, I think, is even stranger than that. But right, right. maybe I'll write you an email about that as well. I mean, okay, so this okay, so I was saying at the start, I mean, what we were kind of thinking, maybe with Jun a little bit. Um, so these capacities you get out of these Lagrangians seem pretty weak somehow, for, at least for four-dimensional embeddings. You know, it's not gonna it's not gonna solve the four-dimensional case. Um, but it turns out, okay, so assuming all this is correct, you would think they'd probably give so they could give stabilized embeddings as well. Um, but even there, in general, at least for ellipsoids, they're, they're, not, they're not gonna be sharp. Mm -hmm. So it's right, so it's a question how much we have to kind of add into this to start getting sharp, em, sharp, embedding, sharp embedding obstructions for ellipsoids, even in the stabilized case. I think I have the impression that folding is a little weak for a target and ellipsoid, even an E12. But maybe I can. I mean, it depends. I'm not sure. It I don't seems think sharp. It seems to be sharp in these Lagrangian examples. For for a target E12, say. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah. uh, well. Okay. Wait a second. I mean, if it's if it's the, okay, there, there's no flexibility. I'm, well, okay. No, no, it's still it's still sharp. Well, I mean, it depends which. So in, in some cases, so I'm saying either either the inclusion is optimal or this kind of like winding up thing is optimal. I think that covers all cases, I believe. Okay, I mean, we can't prove it. We can only prove it sharp in um, in integer cases. Um, but yeah, yeah, right, right. But it's, but it's okay. So this, um, if I can move my, well, maybe not. <laughs> I'm trying. So the, so the thing is, okay, if I can get a. Well, I, actually, I have to. I have to run actually but okay well anyway so we can check that but yeah but so somehow I, th I think right so i'm claiming you probably get sharp for um stabilized poly disks but for stabilized ellipsoids you want to kind of get i mean our kind of project is to kind of get more out of this shape invariant like somehow look at kind of you know isotopies of lagrangian embeddings would be the kind of the next step mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well i'll write you an email i i have I have some questions about that, but I'll, I'll write you an email. So I have to a faculty meeting, actually. So I should go. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's thank Richard again. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop the recording, but we can continue informal chatting.